good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jersey Church Online. It is great to be back with you. And this morning, we uh, get to hear from Pastor Matt as he, as he kicks off the introduction to our study uh, called The Fight, Finding Jesus in the Struggle. This will be a study through the book of Matthew that begins uh, officially next week. And there are study guides available for the study, so uh, if uh, you'd like to follow along with us as we journey through the book of Matthew, make sure and reach out to us and let us know in the chat or uh, send us an email or text and we'll make sure and get a guide out to you. So well, with that said, it is time for a great morning of worship in the chapel. We'll send you over there right now. Good morning and welcome to Jersey. Can we all stand together today as we begin our worship? Let's sing this together. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted and I will. Exalted on high, I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise his name. He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. The King is exalted on high. God, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for just this time to be able to be here and to worship you, God. We pray that as we continue our worship today, God, as we hear from Pastor Matt, God, that we'll be able uh, to uh, be drawn closer to you, God, that our worship of you will be pleasing, God, today. God, we pray that you're honored and glorified through everything that's done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For now, O Lord, on high, above all the earth, how art exalted far above all God. Oh, Lord, on high, 
How great he is, amen. Boy, there are hymns and then there are hymns. So, wow. Well, good morning and welcome to all of you here in person as well as everyone joining us online. It is great to be with everyone today. And if you're new with us, we would love to have an opportunity to meet you and answer any questions you may have. So, uh, make sure if you're here in person, just head out to the welcome area in the main lobby, and uh, there'll be some uh, incredible people there to greet you. And if you're new with us online, all you have to do is text the word NEW to 740-457-1525, and we'll make sure and be in touch right away. Well, what an incredible blessing these past few weeks have been, amen? amen. I mean, going back a couple weeks ago to... Special message from Pastor John 
And then to have that followed up with the testimonies and baptisms of 30 people at the pond. I mean, that was an incredible weekend. You throw in some fireworks on top, and it was just an unbelievable time together. You know, and then last week, as Pastor John passes that baton of leadership to Pastor Matt, and what an incredible moment that was for the life of our family. And we look back on everything that we have to be thankful for in the past, and then to look forward to everything that we have to be thankful for here into the future as well. And with that, we have uh, a couple things to make mention of in terms of what to look forward to. And first off is our 40 days of prayer and fasting begins tomorrow. Now, you might not be looking forward to the fasting part as much, uh, but I think one thing that we can all look forward to is that extra time with the Lord as we replace meals, as we replace other things in our life that we spend time doing in greater dependence upon Him. So if you don't have clarity quite as of yet in terms of what that is going to look like for you over the next 40 days, I want to encourage you to spend some time with the Lord today so that you are ready to go tomorrow. As well, this is the final Sunday to join a group for the fight series. You know, this life can indeed be a struggle at times, but thankfully we don't have to walk that road alone. And so if you're not currently in a group, uh, there are plenty of groups on Sunday morning to choose from, as well as home groups throughout the week. And so at the end of the service today, there'll be an opportunity for everybody to respond in terms of uh, a group to be a part of. Also, if you haven't picked up a study guide for the series as of yet, those are available in the lobby. Make sure you do that today so that you are ready to go tomorrow for our uh, reading plan as we begin our study in the book of Matthew. So with that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, and we do rejoice in what you have been doing in, in the life of our church as well as in the lives of each of us individually. And Lord, we hand this time over to you as Chris prayed earlier that you would use it to glorify you and Lord, we pray specifically also for these next 40 days that we would look back on this time in our church life and see just any number of different ways that you've spoken to us individually as well as corporately as a church body. And Lord, as we begin a new series next week, we thank you for the gift that you give us in this life especially the gift of being a part of a body of Christ, and in that to form relationships with others that are so life-giving that we have an opportunity to study your word together, hear from you together, encourage one another, rejoice with one another, mourn with one another. So we pray that you would lead all of us through that study over the next eight weeks as well. And we give you thanks and praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Three jobs she's barely getting by. Bob got word his mom's been told it's cancer. So many questions, all of them ask why. We're living in a broken world, and the broken world won't give you any answer. Not for long, no, not for long. Cause this broken world is cradled by the Savior, and nothing here can take him by surprise. Someday all this hurting will be over, and every tear's been wiped away. 
What a way to start a series on brokenness and finding Jesus in the struggle. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, Todd already mentioned it, but tomorrow starts the fast. 40 days of just seeking the Lord's will. Let's do it together for what he has for us in the next season, all right? And then today is the last group or day to get into a group, and we're going to talk about uh, the series a little bit this morning. Um, my cousin, uh, when she was little, she wanted to play t-ball. And so she went to the first few practices, she went to the game, and she was sitting in the dugout, and there was a struggle. There was a struggle, and she did everything she could to figure it out. She did everything she could to, to, do, the, to do the thing that baseball players do. She was talking to the coach, she was talking to her teammates, but still, by the end of the game, she had not figured out how to put her hair so that it looked good underneath that baseball hat. <laughs> she really didn't like it. It was a struggle. It was a struggle. Uh, and then, I don't know about you, but uh, I struggle on days when I'm late. Because inevitably, when I'm late, traffic is the worst. Amen? And you're going, you know what? Normally, this is a five-minute drive, but now it's turned into a six-minute drive, and I'm already late, right? The struggle is real. But then we have stories uh, on a more serious note, like, uh, like the book Unbroken. Has anybody read that or seen the movie with, uh, by Laura Hildebrand? Yeah, about Louis uh, Zamperini, uh, the, the Olympic runner and World War II veteran who, whose bomber crashed over the Pacific Ocean, and he was in a raft for 47 days. And so they were exposed to the elements, they were exposed to starv starvation, to shark attacks, uh, you know, sharks trying to bite the, the raft and them having to patch it. And, and then after the 47 days, things didn't get better. When he finally made it to land, he was captured by the Japanese and he was put in a, a prisoner of war camp for two years. And, and after the war was over, uh, you know, he comes home and he struggles with, uh, with PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder, as you can imagine, with, with thoughts of revenge, thoughts of bitterness, thoughts of anger, uh, and he turns to alcohol. But in 1949, his life was turned around at a Billy Graham crusade where he went there and he accepted Christ for the first time. And like a, like a miracle, 
like a miracle that the only way that Jesus can do, his life is turned around. The bitterness, the hate, the anger is gone. The, he's able to function with the PTSD much better. He even is able to go to Japan and spend time with the ones who are his prison guards and forgive them. That's, that's a struggle that where Jesus met him in. Little did he know that when he was floating around on that raft, little did he know that when he was in the prison camp, Jesus was with him in the struggle. Jesus saw where it was leading him. And then Jesus met him when he had the mental health struggles. Jesus met him when he had the drinking struggle. Jesus met him when he had the anger and the bitterness. And Jesus helped him to find peace. Jesus is with us in the struggle. Amen? Amen. Amen. This, this, this study, the fight, finding Jesus in the struggle is about life scenarios like that. And we all can relate from my cousin's hat to the World War II veteran, right? You know, we, there's and everything in the middle. We've all had struggles. And what's interesting about the book of Matthew, which is where we're going to be for the next eight weeks, is Matthew was written out of a time of struggle. It was written by a guy named what? Matthew, thank you. I was just going to, just testing your Bible knowledge, <laughs> right? Matthew is one of the 12 disciples that Jesus called. And we see that in Matthew 9. He actually relates his own story of being called. But in the dating of this book, there's, there's two different thoughts. And, and the reason they're important is because there are two different thoughts on the dating, but they, they come down to the same reason it was written. Some think it was written after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And because out of that rose a, 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 Jew, a Judea, Judaistic teaching that really condemned Christians. And, and it, it, it began to, to heat up persecution from the Orthodox Jews against those Jews believing in Jesus Christ. Some think it was written before 70 AD because we see in the book of Acts, Paul, when he travels around, the Jews beat him, they stoned him, they whipped him, they threw him out of the synagogue. There was already a little bit of persecution from Orthodox Jews against Christian Jews. Whatever date you take, the purpose of the book is the same. Matthew was written to encourage Jewish Christians who are being persecuted by Orthodox Jews. The Orthodox Jews are saying, Jesus is not the Messiah, the Messiah being the one anointed by God that was to come and rescue the nation of Israel and expand the kingdom of David, right? But Jesus came not as a political figure, Messiah, but as the savior of our souls. And so as we look at this book, Matthew is writing it, one, as a biography of Jesus' life on earth. He's writing it to tell us about Jesus' life on earth, his, his, his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so they, they attach on to Matthew uh, often saying the gospel of Matthew because it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I would say that Matthew himself wrote this. It's a biographical defense of Jesus as the Messiah. He was trying to equip Jewish Christians on how to respond to the persecution that they were experiencing. And, and so, so think of it this way. Think of it this way. Put yourself into the, the shoes of a first century Jewish Christian, all right? You grow up in this tight-knit Jewish community. You have rabbis, elders, priests, men who, who would have poured into you as you were growing up, men whom would have been not just advisors in spiritual matters, but in relational, in family, in business, in, in society. These would have been the men you go to. Well, and then you have an experience with Jesus, like all of us in this room have had, where you experience Jesus' love, Jesus' mercy, Jesus' forgiveness, and you begin to say, this is the one. This is the one all these people have taught me about, the one who's come to save me. This Jesus is the one. So you begin to follow him. And next thing you know, at your door is that same rabbi, that same priest, that same elder. And they look at you and they say, unless you recant, unless you stop following Jesus, we're done with you. Don't come to the synagogue. Don't come to the community meetings. And in fact, you might need to move or we're gonna burn your house down. In, in that moment, these, these people who would have been your supporters in the past, all of a sudden are looking at you with that stern, bitter face, threatening your life, 
threatening your existence, threatening the one you believe in. And really it's not even the dislike of Jesus that they have. It's just the disorientation that you would have because the relationships that you once leaned into are now turning against you. And you begin to ask what? You begin to ask the questions, is Jesus worth it? With this struggle, is Jesus true? With this fight, is, is Jesus real? I mean, I know I had this emotional, spiritual experience, but was it real? And is Jesus really the Messiah? You know, what's interesting about that is I think we ask the same questions today. I think when life hits us in the stomach or hits us in the nose or knocks us down, we begin to ask ourselves, is this worth it? Is, is following Jesus worth it? Guys, there are so many, there are so many forces, there are so many people that want to drive a wedge between us and Jesus. They want to separate us from him. And they use struggle, they use hard times, they use brokenness to try to drive that wedge deeper and deeper and deeper. And we often find ourselves asking the question, Jesus, are, is this real? Are you worth it? And so as we go through this next series called The Fight, Finding Jesus in the Struggle, we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at finding Jesus in the struggle for salvation, finding Jesus in the struggle of our brokenness, finding Jesus in the struggle of our sin, finding Jesus in the struggle of persecution and doubt and demonic, finding Jesus in the, in the struggle against demonic forces and corrupt world systems. And in the end, we're gonna find the truth of who Jesus is. And we're gonna be able to look him in the face and say, yes, this is real. And that was the whole purpose of the book of Matthew. That's why we're doing it in this book today. So we're gonna to start there today, all right? Are you good with that? All right, let's turn to chapter four, verses 23 through 25. And as you turn there, uh, in the book of Matthew, at this point, we've already seen Jesus's miraculous birth We've seen his baptism. He's been taken in the wilderness and tempted by the devil. He actually has moved out of his, his hometown of Nazareth to a town uh, a little bit north called Capernaum. And he's even called four of the 12 disciples at this point, Peter, Andrew, John, and James. All right, and then we come to this passage uh, in verse, or chapter four, verse 23, it says, now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease among the people. Then the news about him spread throughout Syria. So they brought to him all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon possessed, the epileptics and the paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. This, this passage is fascinating. As I studied it, I did not realize the importance of just this, this quick summary of what Jesus's ministry looked like. And this is why. If you go throughout the book of Matthew, Jesus did three things. He taught, he preached, and he healed. He taught, he preached, and he healed. In fact, you see summaries like this literally throughout the entire book. In fact, if you go to Matthew 9, 35, you almost see verbatim what he said in 4, 23 through 25. So Matthew 9, 35, he says, Jesus continued going to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. It is almost word for word. It's the same. And so what I find fascinating here is this summary that if, if you kind of for a moment take away theological stuff, take away spiritual stuff, and just look at the practical, what did Jesus' Jesus's day-to-day life look like? He was an itinerant preacher. He was an itinerant teacher. He traveled from town to town, teaching, preaching, healing, teaching, preaching, healing. He probably taught the same thing over and over and over again. He probably preached the same thing over and over and over again. He healed the same diseases again and again. He saw the same problems from town to town. And, and so this is, this is just what he did. And I think sometimes we get lost in, um, 
in the, in, in the spiritual and the theological and, and we think that Jesus literally walked around with a halo and he walked around and he kind of, he didn't walk, he floated. You know, those type of people that float in and out of rooms. No, Jesus was fully man, but he walked and he talked with people and he taught them, he preached to them and he healed them. Those are the three actions that we see. And where did he do it? It starts uh, in verse 23. It says, now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, all over Galilee. Now, I tried to put this, I, tried, I was looking on Map Ohio, trying to figure out how to explain Galilee. Galilee is about 70 miles by 40 miles. That's almost twice the size of Franklin County. Or no, it's over twice the size of Franklin County and Licking County, all right? I couldn't find an exact measurement, but just imagine those two counties doubled and then a little bit more. So he's traveling all over this. And the, the historian Josephus said that there were 204 towns in that area. And so Jesus traveled from town to town to town to town. Now, if he visited two a day, it would have taken him three months to get through all of them, right? And, and, and I don't think that really includes all the travel time that he would have had to take it. So, and, and they think there's a little under 3 million people in this region for, for this period. So there's a lot of people, a lot of towns and cities that he had to go to. And he was just traveling from one to the next, preaching and teaching. I even wonder if some days he, he, he taught the same sermon, the same lesson in one town, walked a few hours and then did the same thing in the evening that night. You know, I just, I, that's what his ministry looked like, preaching, teaching, and healing. Um, but what did he teach and what did he preach? Let's look at that. What did he teach and what did he preach? First of all, teaching, teaching is, is instruction on ethical and moral truths. So teaching is sitting down and you're giving instruction on an ethical and moral truth to somebody saying, here, here's how I explain telling the truth. Here's how I explain you know, having this moral. And, and they lay out an argument for that. Preaching, on the other hand, is like this. It's a, it's a, there's not really an engagement as much as a proclamation of a truth where you're, you're declaring a truth. And so it's a proclamation of a truth you're trying to convince people of. So that's what he's doing. He's teaching and he's preaching, but he's doing it with... Um, let me turn my page here. He's doing it with the good news of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. He's preaching and he's teaching about the good news of the kingdom. What's, what's that mean? Well, this term for kingdom is, is really talking about uh, not a geographical location, but authority and rule and reign that somebody has, power that somebody has. So Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the authority and the power of the kingdom of God. And if you go back to verse 17 in chapter 4, it says, From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, because God's power is breaking through into this world. Repent, because God's reign and God's rule is starting to take hold in and around you. So as Jesus is teaching this and he's preaching this, what he's really saying is, look, God's on the move. God's moving and God's salvation is coming. You know, he's not talking about his crucifixion at this point because he's not been crucified. You and I know the end of the story. But what he's doing right now is he's just giving the foundation. Look, people, you need to repent of your sins and believe because God's kingdom is coming. It is pushing out the kingdom of darkness. It is pushing out the powers of this world and his power, his reign, his rule, his authority is coming now and you need to submit to it. That's what he is proclaiming as he's preaching and teaching. And I just love it because, because it's the same message for us today. We have to submit to the power of God. We have to submit to the authority of Jesus. Why? Because no, no authority can face him. He is the highest. He is our sovereign Lord. And you wanna know how Jesus proved that? He taught it, he preached it, and then he showed it through his healing. Somebody, one of the commentators I read about uh, called Jesus' healing his kingly credentials. As he proclaimed the kingdom, as he proclaimed and taught that God was on the move, he did things to show that to be real. When we think healing, 
A lot of times we think of, uh, I was playing with the kids, the na- my kids and the neighborhood kids in the street the other day and, and one of the little boys ran and tripped and he fell and he kind of scuffed his knee and he got up and he, you could tell he was, he was deciding on whether or not to cry. Right? And now in, in our home, what we did when our boys did that, I would usually run over, I'd pick them up, go, hey buddy, good job, all right, keep going. Maybe do something to make them laugh because then they would decide they didn't wanna cry, right? And then you'd have to deal with that. Um, now, obviously, if there, was, if there was blood, we would deal with it. But most of the time when kids fall, it's just, they're scared, right? They're scared, so you wanna pick them up and say, hey, you're safe, it's okay, let's keep going. And my sons have received that well. So with this side, kid, I did, I did the same thing. Pick him up, hey man, you're all right, let's get going. And he's looking at his knee and there was a scrape, there was a scrape. He looks at me and he's still deciding whether or not to cry. I'm gonna go inside and get a Band-Aid. All right, man, you go inside and get a Band-Aid. So he goes running inside. He wasn't inside for 30 seconds. I think his mom probably knows him. So she had the Band-Aids on the counter. He put one on and you would have thought nothing had ever happened, right? And he was running just like, you know, we, we think of, you know, in that, in that thing, it was like, oh, miraculous healing. Your knee doesn't hurt anymore, right? You know, he needed the Band-Aid. He needed the Band-Aid. You know, or, or I was reading about uh, the Mayo Clinic this week and some of the, just the groundbreaking work they did in the 50s on heart procedures and, you know, just the ability that they have through the knowledge and the resources. But on their website, it literally says healing starts here. Healing starts here. And, and we, you know, we, everybody has great respect for the Mayo Clinic. They're always ranked high because they're good at what they do. They're good at helping us figure out problems with our body. And they're good at, at then finding solutions on how to find healing. Often that, it goes back to medicines and, and surgeries and, and just changes of lifestyle, you know, because they've done so much research. And, and often people find healing through the Mayo Clinic, right? But the, the healing of Jesus is so much more. It's so much more than a Band-Aid. It's so much more than a surgery. It's so much more than a medicine because he literally stood or sat there and people would bring their loved ones, their friends, their neighbors, and he would would maybe reach out and touch. He might just say a word. He might pray over them. One time he put mud in a gentleman's eyes and they were healed, 100% fully healed. And what that told people is I'm not just talking about some power, I'm going to show it to you. And let's look at how that power displays itself. So at the end of verse 23, it says uh, that Jesus was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, this doesn't mean that in Galilee, there were no more sick people when Jesus was done. It doesn't mean that every single sick person was healed and there was no more nothing. It was, or no more sickness. It it means that every person that was brought before him was healed. And what it's, what it's trying to inform us of is that there was no sickness, there was no disease that was more powerful than Jesus. Every sickness and every disease that was brought before him, he had the power to heal and he did. So it doesn't matter if it was cancer. It doesn't matter if it was the flu. It doesn't matter if it was COVID. It doesn't matter if it was, um, I'm trying to think of a disease and I just went blank, right? But you all know, you all get the point. You all get the point, right? There was nothing, there was no bodily ailment that was more powerful than the power that Jesus had. He was, and and that's his kingly credential. He proclaims the, the kingdom is coming. And then he says, let me show you the power of the kingdom. And everybody was healed. Everybody that was brought before him healed. And then it says that people start bringing him from Syria and from all over. But it goes down in uh, verse 24. It says, so they brought to him all those who were afflicted. Let's just go through these words real quick. Afflicted, that word means to be pressed in upon. So all those who were pressed in upon or pressured by pain or physical ailment, everybody, they were healed. Then it says, those suffering from various diseases and intense pain. It didn't matter what kind of pain you came to. It could be knee pain. It could be shoulder pain. It could be migraines. It didn't matter. He, you, whatever pain you brought before Jesus, he had the power to heal. And then, then here, here, here's where it gets interesting. It's not just physical. They brought the demon possessed and the epileptics. So the demon possessed, those who had a demon inside of them, Jesus sent the demon out. There was no demon or spiritual force that was stronger than Jesus. 
Jesus could handle anything the devil threw at him, any demon, any legion of demon, any group of demons, Jesus could deal with it and cast them out and make the person well again. So it's not just physical power or, or power over the physical body, but it's a spiritual power over the forces of darkness. The kingdom of God is coming. And with epileptics, we, we see in the book of Matthew that often uh, at this time, epilepsy or seizures was connected to demon possession. So not always, but sometimes. And so again, this is more of a, a, a demon possession issue where Jesus is casting demons out saying, look, no demon has more power than I do. So the physical body was healed. Spiritual forces were put at bay. And then at the end, they put the paralytics. And I think this is just a special one people who had parts of their bodies that were paralyzed. Could have been from birth, could have been from an accident. People that couldn't walk, people that couldn't use their hands. I, just, I had this friend in seminary. He was born with a deficient hand and leg where he couldn't straighten his leg out. His mind was perfectly fine. And, and he pushed himself. He played sports. He, he, he got his master's in theology at seminary. But I remember thinking as we were studying through the gospel one day going, this is what would have happened. I would have brought my friend like him to Jesus and Jesus would have touched his hand and it would have gone. Jesus would have touched his leg and it would have straightened out. Jesus had power over, this, over the, 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 the issues that our bodies had, either from birth or from accidents that happened. People who couldn't walk ran. People who couldn't use their hands began to, to build houses because the power of God through Jesus, the kingdom of God was coming and Jesus had his healings were evidences of that. The point is this, Jesus broke into the lives of that first century Jewish community in Galilee. And he began to look at these people in their brokenness, in their struggle, and he said, I'm here for you. He began to look at them in their ailments and in their, their struggle with spiritual forces. And he said, I'm in this with you. Jesus was in the struggle with them. He didn't leave them. He didn't abandon them. God sent Jesus to be in the struggle with us. Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you to the end of the age. Jesus is promising that he is always with you. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord, your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. And then John 16, 33, I love this verse. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. You will have suffering. You will struggle. You will have things that you've got to fight in. Be courageous. I have conquered the world, Jesus said. Some, some versions say, I have overcome the world. I love that. In our brokenness, Jesus enters in because he's overcome it. He's already overcome it for you. He's already pushed it back for you. I love the story that I read this week of uh, an eight, uh, 19th century Norwegian violinist. His name was Ole Bull, O-L-E-B-U-L-L. -L -L. Great name, Ole Bull. And he was a composer who traveled all over Europe, all over America, was considered the, the, the most renowned violinist of his time. Well, while I was traveling through Euro Europe one time, he got lost in a forest on a cold night. And he stumbled upon this log hut of a hermit. And the hermit, the old man brought him in, fed him, gave him water. And as they were sitting in front of a blazing fire, the hermit pulls out this old beat up and scarred uh, violin and he begins to scratch out some tunes. So old bull looks at him and goes, can I, can I try? He goes, oh, no, no. The, the hermit says, I've, I've tried for years to learn and, and I've been working on it for a long time. It's very difficult. And old bull looks at him and says, well, can I, can I try? And he goes, sure. So he hands him the old violin and old bull takes the bow and he begins to play the most beautiful of music. So beautiful, the hermit begins to cry. Guys, our life, our life is that beat up and marred violin. Our strings are ready to snap. The bow is bent. We hear screechy music all the time. But when Jesus grabs a hold of it, he plays music that's fit for angels through your life. That's when he meets you in the struggle. 
Our lives are filled with struggle, but Jesus never abandons you. He always meets you there. And so this, this fall, we're gonna lean into Jesus as we give him our struggles, as we give him the things that we heard about, as we give him the things that, that are hard in our life. And we're gonna let him play music through our lives to this world. Because Jesus has not just come He's not just come to show love and kindness and mercy. He's come to save you from your sin. And if anybody in here doesn't know what I'm talking about, I can tell you this today, that if you you look at your life, you know that things aren't all right. You know that you've messed things up. You know, like me, that you've made mistakes. And what you do is you just say, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry for these mistakes. Be the Lord and Savior of my life, and he will change your life. He will change it and he will turn it 180 and he will give you peace and he will give you joy just like he gave Louis Zamperini at that Billy Graham crusade in 1949. So this is what I want us to do. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to take your phones out here. (gasps) All right, guys, we need to go through this study together. So you can take your phone out right now. And if you wanna do this study and you have a grow group, I want you to text to text the number. Do we got it on the screen? Oh, there it is. They're on top of it. Thank you, guys. Text the number, 740-457-1525. And if you are in a group, just say, I'm in a group. Just text, in a group. But if you want to do this study and you're not in a group, you're, you, haven't, you don't have a grow group right now, text to us, need a group. And one of us from the church will follow up with you. We'll help you find a group so that you can do this study with us and we can give our struggles to Jesus. We can lean into Jesus during our times of struggle, all right? So if you're in a group, you can text the number, text in a group, and we know you're with us and you're gonna do the study. If you're not in a group, text need a group and we'll get you a group, okay? All right, let me go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we close now, God, I pray that if there's anybody in here who needs a group to do this study with, that that you would have them text us so so we can help them find a group. Lord, lay it upon their heart. Let let this study be a time where we as a church lean into the tough times in our life, lean into the struggle and find you there. God, we know that you will not abandon us. We know that you will never leave us or forsake us. And so, Lord, we proclaim today that no matter what happens in our lives, God, we want to follow you. Teach us how to give our struggles to you through this study. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Pastor Matt said, there is uh, so much to look forward to over the next couple months. And as we get together to really dive into the book of Matthew and uh, as just going through the study and, and studying through it and putting together, uh, confident that the Lord has plenty to share with us through the fight. So as he said, if you're not in a group, uh, even if you're with us online and not in a group, we would love to know about that. We have plenty of in-person groups. We also have a few online groups as well. So go ahead and text that same number that, uh, that Matt said in terms of having a group or a needing group, and we'll be back in touch with you. With that said, have a great week, and we look forward to being back together next Sunday.